Welcome to the February Diamond Valley Writers Guild meeting. Uh, we got a great agenda for you and a great speaker. Yay, you can clap, you can clap. Okay. Yay. A reminder to the Zoom participants, if you could please mute your mic when you're not speaking. Um, and then during the presentation, if Debbie wants to take questions during, then you can unmute or maybe she'll wait till the end, it'll be up to her. Um, anthology, it's underway. If you have a story that you would like to submit, there are guidelines on the website. Um, if someone could put the link in the Zoom, that would be great. We also have flyers here on the table with a scan code on it to get to the website. And the basic theme of the anthology is animals, wild or domestic, beloved pets or rascally pests, even mythical creatures. The animal must be integral to the story or poem, not merely a cute, cuddly cameo. Although they need not be the central character, they should inform or be essential to the plot or impact the main character in a meaningful way. So that's the theme of our Diamond Valley Writers Guild anthology for 2024. Um, the deadline to submit is May 1st, and it's an 1800 word max. The guidelines will tell you specifically what to put in the subject line and what the other guidelines are. Um, you can submit up to two poems and two short stories um, or less, it's up to you. Um, the, no, nothing that's been previously published unless it was in an issue of Straight Jackets. So that's kind of the rundown, but there's a lot more little guidelines you should probably read. Um, we're starting to get submissions. We're excited about this. It's gonna be fun, fun project. Um, Jessica, turn it over to her for a second. <coughs> Sorry, quick technical shift. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. <laughs> I'm here to remind everyone that it is the first of the year and in the first quarter it's my job to harass everyone into renewing. Um, so this is my first reminder um, that it is February and so to turn in your dues $25 for general members out of high school and college for college it's 15 and for high school it's 10 so if you know any youngins who are really good writers or you think they have potential or could benefit from our meetings and you think that they would be a good addition to the guild, please send them my way, I'll be feel free to, to give them a, a introductory and maybe even get them into the guild. Um, if you want to renew, you can do it through PayPal, which we have links to our on our website to it, or you can just do it to the dvwritersguild at gmail.com through PayPal itself, or you can hand me cash. I'm back there with a cash box, um, and so I can give you change if you need it. So. We do accept checks as well. You can mail checks to our PO box at 1154. Uh, um, and or you can hand them to me today and I'll take care of it. Um, a reminder for members that if you are a member currently with a book on our book page uh, coming May or March 1st, March 1st, we're March 1st we start taking down the non-renewed members books. Um, so if you have a book up there and you like it up there and you want to keep it up there, make sure to renew by February 29th, it is a leap year, uh, 29th uh, by midnight. We'll make sure that you stay up there for the next year or so. So thank you so much. Uh oh, I hope it's still recording. That sounded weird. Oh, that was you. Okay. Um, and by the way, Jessica is our treasurer, if you didn't figure that part out. There are a lot of benefits to membership, and one of them is the anthology. Uh, you must be a paid member in order to be considered for the anthology, as well as other other benefits that you can look at the website and see what those are. All right, Kevin, do you have any kind of an update on the website or any particular thing you want to point people to? Are you there? That's our vice president, yeah. Kevin Kindle. Yeah, um, uh, I was going to mention the part about the books. You have to have your membership renewed by the end of February. Because on March 1st, I will start uh, removing some of the books that, for people that haven't renewed. And otherwise, um, I've started trying to follow a lot of authors. So even without them telling me that they've released new books, as they release new books, um, I've, at, I've been adding them to the page. So I'm kind of trying to be a little bit proactive on that sense. But uh, the member page does get a lot of traffic. And I've kind of realign the home page a little bit so like the anthology information all those announcements are right below the next meeting information so you can click on that page it takes you to the link to the dvg dvwg submissions 
uh, email account, and it has all the outline for what is required for the anthology. So I'm trying to relay the out, re, or realign the website to be a little more uh, information on the homepage. That's pretty much all I got. Thank you, Kevin. You're doing a fabulous job at that website. It looks great. Absolutely great. Um, Lynette, you have several announcements. You want to start with a YouTube announcement? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, good. Just make sure I unmuted. No good talking to nobody. Um, so we have all of the 2020, the old um, meetings up on our YouTube site, and we're working on getting the 2021 uh, videos up. YouTube is a little strange in that uh, it messes up the chronology, and that's why we're going back and trying to load the old ones first, and then we will get um, our current year. So very exciting. There is a link on our webpage to the YouTube channel, and you can also just subscribe, and it will give you an update uh, when we load new stuff. So very exciting. We're going to have the whole library uh, several years and several years of good speakers and information out there. Thank you. And do you have an update on shout outs? Yes, I do. Um, we are coming up on, uh, we do our shout outs at the end of the, sorry, I was looking at the calendar, at the end of the month for the previous month. So um, please get your um, shout outs and celebrations in by the 20th. Just send them to the uh, guild's mailbox. And if you would, this will be for uh, new publications or exciting things. Maybe you got nominated for an award or won an award. Um, maybe, and we had a great question from Karen. Thank you, Karen. Um, if you run a um, sub stack or you have a blog, let us know so we can promote that for you. What we would like, and this is for paid members. So another benefit of paying your membership this year, guys, I do go out and check when you guys send me stuff to make sure that you're a paid member because you know, that's, that's part of the beauty of membership and it is very inexpensive compared to other guilds. This is probably a third of the price that I pay. Yeah. In joining other guilds. So send me a picture of your cover. A JPEG is great. Um, a blurb, just like what you'd have on the back. Like um, we know that covers draw people and they go, Oh, that's an interesting cover. I think I need to read this book. Follow that up with a little blurb about, you know, the super dog that saves the world, whatever you wrote about. And then, of course, most importantly, let's make sure you get paid and let's make sure you sell books. Send me the link for buying your book, your purchase link. So if you need help, because not all of us are techies, let me know. Just put it in there. I need help and I'll um, reach out to you and help you with that. So this will be uh, shout outs going out at the end of February will be for celebrations and new releases and that sort of information for January of this year. Okay, great. For those of you who don't know, Lynette is our member at large director. She is one of our board of directors. So her job is outreach to the membership. So if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to Lynette or ask her. She's She is the point of contact between membership and the board for everybody. If you have concerns, questions, or if, you know, suggestions, anything. Um, Kidlet Critique and Accountability Group. Again, Lynette. Again. Okay, we're trying something new this year. I'm pretty excited about it. And this fits beautifully with our speaker today with, with um, writing for kids. Um, we're going to try to do a kid lit critique group. Now, I just put the question on the feedback from the meeting last month. So I didn't get a great response. I only had like two people that were interested. And I know that you guys, that there are people who are writing for children, picture books, young, you know, middle grade. Um, young adults. And I think that you're an underserved group within our guild. So what I'm hoping we can do this year is get a once a month uh, critique and support meeting, even if you just come so that we can say, you know, keep going, keep going, keep writing. Or if you really have something that you're like, guys, I just don't know if, if this is jiving or whatever. Um, we'd like to do that. So I think what I'm going to do this month is send out a separate email to our mailing list, just in case maybe you didn't make it to the meeting and didn't hear about it last month, or maybe you didn't um, fill out the feedback form, please fill it out. It really helps us. And we do read, we read all the comments, um, but I'm going to send that out 
to the to the mailing list separately this month see if we get even if we only have two people i think that this is worthwhile and we'll coordinate with everybody's schedules um because we want to make sure that all our writers with all their needs have support here at the guild thank you thank you lynette you're doing a great job really appreciate all of your hard work on this um now jessica has another announcement i'll turn the microphone back over to her Good to see you all again. Um, so another reminder, we have, as you see, this lovely, lovely setup that we set up every month. And if you're thinking, once again, this is so cool and I wanna be a part of it and I wanna be a part of the dream team, I've got the offer for you. Please join us uh, every meeting in the morning. If you come at about 8.15, 8 um, you can help us set up. You can learn how to work the system and possibly even run it if one of us is out. So if you're interested in that, want to learn a new skill, or just want to have some good conversation and maybe occasionally donuts, please join us early in the mornings to help set up for the hybrid system. This, everyone on Zoom, I know you guys appreciate it the most because you wouldn't be here without it. So uh, too bad you all can't join us to, to help out with it. But hopefully we see some of you next month to help set up. Thank you, Jessica. And I want to also thank Aiden, Sophia, and Liam, along with Jessica. The four of them have just been troopers for the last two years since we went back to live meetings on a hybrid format because we didn't want to leave all of our members out of state and even out of country. We have some people who don't even live in, well, our vice president lives in Canada. And uh, one of our directors lives in Montana. So we didn't want to lose anybody by going back from fully Zoom during the shutdown to live so that's why we invested as a guild in the hybrid system um and it's working beautifully but these four young individuals and they're probably our youngest members of the guild besides maybe one high school student one college student that we have have been here every single once a month saturday 10 times a year for the last two years at 8 8 15 to help bring this program to everybody so i'd like to give them a round of applause for their hard work Okay, on to member successes, project starts, completions, awards, recent publications. Anybody on Zoom have anything that fits that criteria? Go ahead and unmute and tell us about your wonderful success. Well, I don't know if it counts, but thinking of our own anthology, I thought about another story in another anthology, and it's about pets. So I went through and it's more than our anthology. It's about 18 to 1900 words, but I still love it. So I published it about a week ago as a single title, and it's called A Different Kind of Mom. And it's the subtitle is Did I Rescue Him or Did He Rescue Me? Oh. He was a rescue puppy that I loved and was a wonderful pet for over 20 years. And it led to quite a few, excuse me, quite a few others. So um, right now, since it's a short, short story, it's only 99 cents. But starting tomorrow for a few days, it will be free. So take a look and try it. See what you think. Excellent. If you can get the information to Lynette, maybe she can include it in the shout out. Oh, okay. I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody in the room have a new project start? Something they're excited Michelle, about? Michelle. Yes, Karen. Yes. I'm I'm not going to show my face because I'm still in my robe and jammies. <laughs> oh, but we like seeing you that way. We like you that way. Yes, yes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I just wanted to say I just published probably about my eighth, seventh or eighth piece in uh, Substack. And so if anybody wants to subscribe to that, it's free. And you just go to Karen Robertson's Substack. It's called, this one is called, I Knew Red Skelton, Almost, or Kind Of. So uh, anyway, enjoy. And I'm going to send Lynette uh, the link to it and so forth. So thank you. Excellent. So since we're we're on Zoom, anybody else on Zoom who would like to announce something that they have done? 
Yeah, so I'll just go ahead and mention that fortunately uh, in the last uh, week and a half or so, I've been on a uh, blog tour uh, with iReads blog tours. And what they have is they they used to have traditional where you would go into several different bookstores and now it's done as a blog uh, series. And so I have a series of people uh, reviewing my books, including Marcus and the Emperor's Coin and Rockin' Book Review said, very young children can learn and be entertained at the same time. And then uh, here's one from uh, a lady named Gina Ray Mitchell. She says, the two cent piece is a delightful read for children imparting valuable lessons about faith, love, and the power of uh, trusting in God and there with the In God We Trust series. So I'm really glad that that's happening. And uh, I had 22 stops and people were uh, oh, making comments. And they also have on many of them, the trailer that Liam, uh, our guild member, actually produced a short trailer for Marcus and the Emperor's Coin, and he's helping me with the two set piece. So I'm very excited about those opportunities to really share uh, and get the word out there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And boy, I'll tell you, you've gone from saying, I think I'll write a children's book to having two out. I'm so proud of you, Dennis. You're doing a great job. And they're good books. If you're looking for something for a grandchild or a niece or nephew or or something um keep it in mind they're really good little books anybody Thank else you. on zoom you're welcome dennis anybody else on zoom have any announcements that they want to make about successes or starts Has anybody like not been writing for a long time and they started a new project we like to hear about that too okay anybody in the room would you like to okay. you got to come go to the mic in the center walk around go to the mic Hap has got something to say. Here she comes. Hi, everybody. Well, it's probably nothing I'll ever publish, but this is the first time I have kept a journal since January 1st, and I've written in it every single day. So um, kudos to you guys. You've been so motivating, and I actually am writing every single day. So <laughs> thank you. Good for you. That's an accomplishment, isn't it? Anyone else either in the room or on Zoom that wants to make an announcement? All right, well, I'll make a real quick announcement because I don't get a chance to, too, very often. But the Temecula, Writers and Val Temecula, Temecula Valley Writers and Illustrators group, which um, is, we have a kind of reciprocity with them. They're not actually part of our group. We do have some members here. I'm a member over there. They're doing an anthology as well. And it's uh, going to probably be coming out by about the same time ours is. And so they were requesting synopses of short stories. So I sent in a synopsis, they accepted it, and up to a 5,000 word story. So then I had to write the story because I hadn't written the story when it was accepted. And uh, I'm almost done. I'm at 4,600 words, it's due tomorrow. And tonight, guess what I'll be doing? But it goes in first draft. So I'm excited because that was nice to get an acceptance email saying your concept has been accepted, get the story in by February 18th. So here I am. So I'll be doing that tonight <laughs> and that's it. Okay, we're going to move on to our writing tip. Every month, one of our members does a writing related tip. And tonight or today is Brenda Hill, whom I just think she's a fabulous writer, a great member, and very supportive of the Guild and also on our anthology committee. So thank you for serving. We also, um, I should have probably also recognized Kay, who is in the room, is also on the anthology committee, as is Liam. So the board of directors is involved, but then those three individuals are volunteering their time to read and help edit and do things to get that up and underway. Anyway, um, Brenda, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And I hope this time that the audio will be a little bit better than before. I've got a new headset and a super duper mic. And from what I've heard from the testing and from here, it's working beautifully, so I'm glad of that. What I want to talk to you today is about outlining your novel, and I want to share with you how I do mine. When I was first learning years ago, I was taught all these index cards and notebooks, and since I'm such a disorganized person, I had index cards all over the place, couldn't find anything, 
So over the years, I developed my own system. So when I'm starting a novel, I go through and write, and this is usually in a notebook, uh, information about my basic story idea, what it is, what it's about, what genre, my main character, strengths, flaws, weaknesses, the villain. And one thing to remember when you're writing your villain, it doesn't necessarily have to be something horrible, like a volcano or a meteor crashing into Earth or even Hannibal Lecter. It can simply be someone who does not want your main character to reach his or her goals. And it can be that simple, and it depends on the genre in which you want to write. And then your main character's goals, we need that. What he wants more than anything in the world. And that will guide your story all the way through his struggles to reach that goal, his setbacks. And you must have your character struggling. Back when I was editing full-time and teaching novel writing, I had an older student who had a hard life, and her story was all about characters who were happy. And I said, no, 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 because that will be the most boring story. So you must have struggles. A novel without a struggle is not a novel at all. It's incidents. And then you have your setbacks and then your ending, what happens. Now, once I've got all of that, I go through and I pick out key scenes. Now, I know most of you, especially the experienced writers, know what key scenes are. But for some of the newbies that have a little bit of struggle with it, uh, your key scenes are your plot points. And I use six main plot points. Your ordinary world, which is what you open with. And you will see that on movies and TV uh, series as well. It's the shot when it first opens. And it can be at a library, a hospital, a coliseum. And then it'll focus in on your main character. So you open with a little bit of an ordinary world but you don't want to stay too long on an ordinary world like you did years ago today publishers and readers want things to move a little bit more quickly so then you go into your second one your inciting incident and that should come pretty close to the opening and again depending on uh, the genre then you have plot point one, and that's when things have happened to your main character and they've gone through and they just can't figure out what's happening. They don't know what to do. But plot point one is when they decide to fight back, to take some kind of control. Like in a Western, it's when the wagon trains are all heading out. They actually pull out or... It can be when they circle for a battle. Okay, then you have that section. Then you go to your midpoint. And that is, let's see, that is about the third uh, plot point. And your midpoint is, of course, the middle of your story. And that is when things have become very dire that usually has a death scene, someone has died, maybe in a battle, or they've gotten killed, if it's a serial killer type novel. And that's mainly to show you how serious the midpoint and the uh, middle of your story is. On a romance, it can be your first love scene between the characters. And then since it's been so dire in the middle, then they start to regroup and form a new way to battle the, the villains. Then you come to plot point two, and that's where they face the villains. And usually they come out as a loser, but they 
go through an inward mm, to see what's wrong, to see how they can overcome their flaws, to help them to meet and overcome the villain. And then you have your ending. And it depends on your genre. A wrap-up first and then your ending. And that depends on your genre, whether you want your main character to win, to lose, however you want it, sci-fi, whether you want the earth exploded or however you want it. It's your story. Now, once I've got all of that, I go through and then I pick out maybe one or two sentences for each plot point. And since I'm so disorganized and index cards, I had them all over the place, I needed one sheet where I can glance at everything and see everything on one page. So I designed this sheet. At the top is your Aristotle's incline. And it's a rising dramatic effect. And underneath it, I have blanks for my different scenes. But I have listed up at Aristotle's Incline your opening, your plot point one, your midpoint, plot point two, and your ending. And they go down at the very bottom of your scenes. These lines here are where I put my scenes. And your plot points go down at the bottom. So then you just write to the next plot point. And you take from your notes about your main character, the goals, everything you go through there, and turn them into scenes. Now you not only have an outline for your novel, but you have a starting point, a beautiful starting point to plot your novel. You just fill it out, fill out the, the lines, and the lines depend on your word count for your novel. Your novel can run anywhere from 55,000 to 100,000. I have 10 under each section that's based on 100,000 words. I usually don't make it quite there, but it's it's there. And you can put in as many as you want to fill in for your uh, word count. So I hope that this will help you. It really helped me. And I've got everything in one page. Quick look. So if anyone has any questions, or if anyone would like a copy, yeah, I was going to. I was ah. going to ask. Wait a minute. I'm I was. Sorry. Am I on? Ah, I was going to ask. Is there any way you can email a copy of that to the guild email address? And anyone interested, just let us know, and we'll we'll email it out to you. Could we do that? Absolutely, I'd be happy That'd to be do fabulous. that. And also, um, just a plug, it comes from my book called Plot Your Way to Publication, which I um, put together back in 2003 or four for my writing students at that time and explains everything in detail. But I'll be happy if you don't want to buy that, that's fine. I'll be happy to send this page to the guild for anyone who wants a copy but please don't share too much because they are under copyright but i'd be happy to share with the guild thank you and i and we won't blanket send it i'll actually request people to email the guild and say hey can you send me brenda's sheet and then we will make sure that only the people that ask for it get it also you know thank go you. buy your book go buy your book you. um go to, the, go to the website and look up everybody's books but She's got links on our website, right to Amazon for both her traditionally published and self-published books. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn it over for to Sophia, who is going to introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. 
So today we have an absolutely fantastic speaker, Miss Debbie Johnson, and she's going to be speaking to us about writing for young audiences. Debbie Johnson is a proud mother and karate instructor who gets plenty of inspiration for her stories from having survived raising five children and teaching middle grade karate students. Residing in Southern California with her amazing husband, two dogs, and a turtle, she writes literary fiction, poetry, nonfiction, and children's stories. Her published works include Rock, Paper, Scissors, a picture book, Wendy's Wabby, an early reader, Suburbia and Other Signposts Posting West, a book of poetry, as well as her stories appearing in numerous Chicken Soup for the Soul books. Debbie is currently querying her second novel and a middle grade book. Please come up. Um, thank you for having me here this morning. I'll also try not to get confused with my day job and make you guys get up and exercise. Um, but um, so thank you for having me here. How many of you are um, currently writing children's books? Oh, okay. Um, how many of you are here because you're interested for more information on how to how to write them? Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a really short and sweet answer to how to write them, and I hope it doesn't disappoint you. The exact same way you write for adults. Okay, so um, it is exactly the same thing, except for adults. Sure. All right. Or I'll use my karate voice, whichever one. Um, so. Um, Adults are an easier audience than children are. Children are really honest and blunt, and they will hold your feet to the fire very, very quickly. Um, so when you're writing for them, you have to stop and think about um, their world, their environment. How do they speak? What are they interested in? Not what are what your message is as the author. You're you're trying to. Um, entertain them and communicate with them um, children's literature lit all literature um, it opens up the windows to the world for all of us and offers reflections back on who we are um, i don't know why you guys write i write for a couple of simple reasons to quiet the voices in my head that are constantly wanting their stories told and so that when I write something, I hope that when someone reads it, if they ever read it, that they know they're not alone. We're all kind of those weird people that nobody wants to acknowledge we really are. Um, everybody is an individual. Um, Brenda touched on it a little bit. Um, you can't have everything be happy. Um, people are dimensional. Children are very dimensional. They're us in miniature. Um, stop and think back to yourself as a child. You had the same emotions. You had the same feelings, different triggers for them, perhaps, but you had the same things going on. Um, some of us are older than others. Um, we would have read um, longer than they want to read right now. A lot of graphic novels out there, which are amazing. I don't know if anybody's read any of them. Um, stop and look at some of the top titles that the kids are get enough of. Dogman, um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, which has as many children reading as Harry Potter, and maybe even more if children were really honest about it. Because they have the images, they get the pictures, they live in a video world. And so when you're writing for them, you can't con them. You can't say, hey, you know, um, you've got to write to what they're interested in or they're not going to read it and they're going to tell you. Um, I spend a lot of time with with children. Um, we teach students from ages three to our oldest student right now is 75. OK, so um, there's a, a lot of young kids in there and we have built into the dojo we have a library in there for the siblings who aren't training and i'm always watching what books are they picking up what books are they reading and then i'll flip through the books sometimes and say what is it about this book that is intriguing them because if i'm going to write for them i want to know what it is that interests them 
And I have one young student, she was sitting on the back stairs that we have, and she was diligently reading, and I was so excited, because they don't know I write, um, they just think I like books. Um, and she's reading, and I'm over there, and I'm uh, like, hey, what are you reading? And she's, I don't like this book. I'm like, okay, well, what's wrong with the book? Because, hey, I don't want to write a book for you, you're not going to like either. Well, there's this girl in it, and she's just stupid. And I'm thinking, well, that's a little harsh. Tell me why she's stupid. Well, she doesn't like karate. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> you know, we're all karate guys here. But what is it about it? It got an emotion for her. She kept reading because she wanted to know why. And so you've got to build the same things in for a child um, as you do for an adult. It's the same what Brenda just told you, um, you know, when you're plotting out your book, and I'm not a plotter myself, um, but when you're plotting it out, you've got to hit those beats, you've got to hit those parts in a story. And it's a little bit harder to do in, say, a middle grade book. Um, I've got two novels written. The first one is like 80,000 words. The second one is 86,000. And they were easier to write than the middle grade book that I'm shopping. Because that one's coming in at about 35,000 words. And I had to figure out how to condense all of that, all the things I wanted to express in less words and in words that they would understand without speaking down to them, in words that were their language, in words that they would want to read. And I originally wrote it and I, shot, I, I met with an agent and um, started out with this beautiful daydream scene. And she looked at me, she says, why did you do that? Well, I, you know, I mean, he was, he's going off on this mental adventure. And she says, why didn't you use magical realism? And I, I remember looking at her going, why didn't you tell me to? Um, but I took that input and I went, ran with it and it totally changed the story. And I do use young readers as beta readers, um, but I'm gonna caution you to be very careful about that. Um, I'm in a position of authority with all the students that I'm teaching. They all want to be a black belt. They all want something from me. They, they all look to me for something. I cannot take them a, a book and say, now read this and give me your honest opinion. Because they're just going to look at me and go, oh, Sensei, I loved it. No, you didn't. Tell me why you didn't. Give me the honest truth. So be careful how you pick your beta readers. Um, when my youngest son was in school, he, um, there was a teacher and I, she came to me, she says, do you know all the kids love Veggie Tales? Every kid in my class wants to watch Veggie Tales. And they were like sixth grade. I went, really? She says, yeah, every time I put it on, they get so excited. And I just didn't have the heart to tell her. They don't want to do classwork. They hate veggie tales. They just don't want to do the work. They're telling you what you want to hear. So as you do get beta readers, because everything is exactly the same, exactly the same. I wish there was something special I could tell you writing for children, but it isn't. Creative nonfiction, fiction, children's books, the concepts are all the same. Got to make it interesting. You've got to grab your reader. It has to be something that they want to know more about. There has to be some kind of tension. Um, preaching to them, that just shuts the book. They don't care. They don't, want to, they don't want to hear that. And look at the world that they live in. They live in a, a very Zoom world, um, which I'm just going to tell you, I hate Zoom. <laughs> we Zoom karate classes for two straight years. I hate Zoom. Um, I hope never to Zoom again. And had I known that PJs and a robe were an option, I might have taken it today. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, they live in a world where things happen really quickly and things are different as I'm kind of looking at, you know, who's in the room. Even the youngest of you in here don't have it like they have it now. Uh, social media has changed so much. And are you writing social media into your books? Are you putting things in there? They text. They're, um, 
what they text isn't the way that you or I would write it. I still punctuate my text. Sorry, guys. Um, if I'm feeling just like really crazy, I don't capitalize or I don't put a period once in a while. But they are speaking differently than we're speaking. They are doing everything so differently than us. And they're our audience. So are we here to change that? In our book, some some books I'm reading, that's what it looks like they want to do. Um, when there's a definite agenda message, they're picking up on that too. Um, you have to wrap it in um, something. Ever try to give your dog a pill? Okay, if they know that you're trying to give them medication, they're like, no, gag, gag. I'm gonna... But if you wrap it in peanut butter, right? Okay, our dogs just lap it right up. They don't even realize what happened. And I think that's one of the things you have to do for children's literature. Not trick them, but give it to them in a way that they are receptive to it. Um, how do you decide what the language is? How do you decide who you're writing to? Those are all big questions as you're in the beginning parts of it. Um, sometimes um, I just write it and decide later. What did it fit into? The one I'm shopping, um, the Great Fourth Grade Marshmallow Wars, is based on an actual incident, and some of the names were changed and some were not. Um, in the fourth grade, my son was tasked to build a marshmallow catapult. The entire class, it was the most amaz amazing project. We still have the catapult on our bookshelf. Um, it was really cool, and it is featured in the book. Um, it was a fun project. The kids got so into this, they didn't realize they were learning things, tension and all kinds of things that need to go into building a catapult. How far is that marshmallow going to go? How much does the marshmallow weigh? Um, so that inspired this book. Um, I kept the teacher's name the same with her blessing. She knows that this is for her. Um, basically, it's a steam book so that it fits into a, a market that's needed. Um, STEAM being the newest iteration after STEM. And as an artist myself, I appreciate the, the addition of the A. So um, it's really cool that um, they've done that. And I wanted it to be fun. And my main character, my protagonist, is every kid who has procrastinated a project ever. Um, there, there's not nice people in the book. One of the kids breaks another kid's project. That's what happens. One of them cheats at the end. That's what happens in real life. And they have to learn how to deal with it. Um, looking at it and going, okay, it has to be fourth grade because this happened in the fourth grade and there's some facts I'm not willing to change. That spoke to the language. And if you're not sure what a fourth grader's vocabulary is, go Google it. There are, there are lists of vocabulary words and sight words, and you can find it the whole way through for whatever age you're looking for. But listen to other people. Listen to your audience. How many of you guys spend time with your audience if you're writing? Okay. Good. A lot of teachers are writing, um, I don't know if you're teachers, um, are writing kid lit. Um, I always said growing up, I'd never be a teacher. I was a journalism major. I was never going to get married. I was never going to have kids. And I was going to explore the world. Well, I did parts of those. <laughs> but um, you have to know your audience. You have to um, listen to what's interesting to them. Listen to what they want and then give them a really good story. Now, I had that one, the marshmallow one was easy. That dropped into my lap. That one was super easy. I have a girl pirate story. Well, I think girls could do anything. I think girls, I know girls are as strong as guys, sorry, but I know that they are. I do it every day. I work in a field that is not traditionally for females. And I know that every time I would go to train and they go, oh, you're just a, you're just a woman, whatever. Go, go train with the kids. <laughs> um, so I always pick the biggest guy in the room and I want girls to know that they can do anything. And that's what my pirate girl is about. 
Do you know the girls were not supposed to be on pirate ships? That was bad luck. Well, she's there, and whether she saves the day or not, you'll have to read the book if I ever get it out there. Um, but that, those are the kinds of messages I want them to receive, but I want them to get it in a fun way. And doing that is, is the hard part. Now, how many of you want to write one, but you don't know what to write about? Nobody? Okay. Um, so I thought maybe we'd have a little fun today instead of just me up here speaking. I don't normally stand still, so this is really, really hard for me. <laughs> I want to move. Um, I want you, if you don't mind, grab a, a pen, piece of paper, and I want you to think about, write down, jot down really quickly, five childhood memories. And notice I didn't say that they were always good. Okay, five childhood memories. Just think of something that might. Then just let me know when you're done. Was that harder than you thought it would be? It kind of is, isn't it? And I kind of, I felt bad, but not bad, sorry. Um, so out of those five things, does one of them really stick with you more than the, maybe the first one you wrote? Um, if I were right, if I were going to do this, um, and I purposely didn't think about what would I write before this, um, childhood memories. Um, Growing up, I had one birthday party ever. That's not a big deal. Um, on my seventh birthday, we were going to celebrate at school, and I was too sick to go. So those are, I don't know why both of those are about birthdays, but um, I, I tried to, I was going to run away when I was about seven, and I had everything all organized. I had backpack or bag. I didn't have a backpack. I had stash food. I had books because, hey, I wasn't running away without my books. And I think I had a change of clothes. I think that was it. Um, very last second, I tried to get my sister to go along with me, which my sister and I, only probably because we shared a room because I really didn't want to run away with her. Um, and I was not unhappy. That is not why I wanted to run away. I wanted to run away because I had read a story about some children who lived on their own and this amazing life they had. And I had, a, I had a good life. I had nothing I was trying to run away from. But that's a childhood memory. I chickened out at the last second because, you know, six or seven, it gets kind of cold out there. And I really hadn't scoped out any place to go. I just had a couple of snacks and some books. So um, there, there's three. And out of those, I know which one I'd write the story about. I know which one I would pick because the birthday party ones are kind of boring. 
Um, and there's a lot more adventure I could build into the, I want to run away. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you have wanted to, when you were a child, run away? Things were bad. There were things that, how many of you as an adult? <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's happened, right? Oh, life. So there's a theme that's more universal. Not having a birthday party. I saw the, the sad looks on your faces. You felt more sorry for me than I do. Um, and no, I don't want a birthday party this year. Um, so, um, and that's the theme too. And that's what you need to look to in there. How is that going to touch your reader? How many people felt like, man, I'm the only person in the world that's wanted to run away, even though we know people have done it, or I've, I'm the only one who is different. Um, how many of you guys felt different when you were growing up? You know, I did. I didn't fit into, into the mold of what people thought I should be. I was quiet. I loved to read. I played a lot of sports. I was kind of opposites of things. And I brought work home to study just because I like to study. Um, it really just, you know, I was a nerdy, fun, popular girl, which none of that fits together. And I know lots of students, I see them every day that are the same way, but we all think we're different. And that's because as people, we're all unique. But we don't understand that other people are feeling the same things, have had the same experiences. Anybody in the room ever been bullied? Or, excuse me, and at home, anyone ever been bullied? Okay, it happens. And girls are the worst. Girls are vicious to each other. Girls are just not nice people. Um, sorry, but you're my people. They're just not nice with each other. Think about when you were bullied. What did they do? And what did you do? Probably a lot of internalizing. A lot of story in that right there. A lot of emotion. And when you write it, if that's what you decide to write about, then write it in a way that connects with another person. Not, oh man, you feel bad because you're bullied and you need to go talk to your parent. Of course you do. Of I tell, I tell people that every day, make sure you go home and tell your parents if something happens. But guess what? You can come and tell me too and I'll help you too. That's what they want. They want another connection. They want another something that they can reach out to and that they can feel like I'm okay. Because guess what? She was a weirdo and took books home and studied over long weekends. And I'm not the only one who wanted to read about whatever it was. Um, so stop and look into your own life and look for those nuggets of things and then just write them in the appropriate language for the child. Now, what is appropriate language? Um, depends upon what you're writing. Picture books, you got about 300 words. So you're going to have to be very succinct. You're going to have to pick each word very carefully. Anybody write flash fiction in here? Um, 100 words, 500 words? Usually under five. Under five. Um, I've done a couple of 100 word challenges. I never do anything with them because 100 words is like, oh my gosh. You know, Hemingway and his, his very short story, I think most of you know that one. Um, amazing to fit all that in there. 300 words for a small child, that's a lot. I got invited to our library, which is not nearly as nice as yours. And to read Rock, Paper, Sisters, they, they wanted me to come to their children's group. And I neglected to ask a very important question. Um, and I said, sure, I'd love to, because I'd love to read my book to you. Um, they didn't tell me it was two and three-year-olds. And I should have asked, because my story is not designed for two and three-year-olds. I literally stood there flipping through the pages, talking about the pictures and, oh, look at this, um, making up practically a whole new story as I was there because they were not going to sit still for it. So a good lesson for me on know your audience, right? Um, you've got more words, get to early readers, you got a little bit more, but sometimes I think those are the harder ones to write. 
because you still are so short in what you've got. Um, one of my books, Wendy's Wobby, is really short. Um, I think it's, if it's 10,000 words, I'd be surprised. I should have looked. That one, came, that's another inspiration one. And I really didn't write it um, to get it out in the world. I wrote it to kind of get it out of the head. Um, our youngest son has had this weird skin condition ever since he was born. And we took him to all kinds of doctors. Nobody could tell us what it was. And his fingers would be red, they turned purple, his skin would turn shades, and all the doctors were like, I don't know what it is. I don't know. Finally, he's like 14, 15, we get a referral to a really good doctor, dermatologist. She's used to dealing with young people. And she, um, it's a birthmark, it's just this weird thing. It's not gonna hurt him. There's this procedure you can do to get rid of it. He's like, no, mom, I think it's kind of cool. I wanna keep it. But she doesn't know Christopher. So she tells him this story about Wabi. And you may know about Wabi, you may not. Um, Japanese term, uh, perfect imperfection. And she's telling him about the teacups that are broken and then fixed with gold, beautiful story. Uh, she's telling it to him, and I am just so absorbed into this story. Um, we we go leave, and we're like, no, Mom, I really don't care. And I went, well, she doesn't know. She just talked to the one teenager in the world who does not care what anybody thinks about him. He just is, like, perfectly fine in his own skin, so to speak. Um, but I was captivated with the story. So I went, but a lot of girls aren't happy with who they are body image, all this. So I thought, I'll just write a little story. And then I wrote it, well, you might as well do something with it. So I got it out there. And I sent her a copy of it. Now, we had met her once. That was it. We had another follow-up in six months, just to kind of see where he was and what was going on. And um, during that time period, and I just wrote a little note, said, thank you for sharing that story. I wanted to share with you what I did. Then I sold a bunch of copies of it. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird because I'm not marketing this book. I'm not doing anything with it. We go to the doctor's appointment and she's like, okay, it's all fine. You don't want to do anything, whatever, you know. And then she's, but I have to tell you this story. And then she proceeds to tell me the story of Wendy's Wabi and get in the book and she bought it for all her, her patients and she's going on and on and I'm probably turning like all these different shades by about this point. I'm surprised she's not going, do you have a skin condition? What's going on here? And we leave and, and Chris was like, mom, why didn't you tell her that you wrote the book? I was like, cause I was so amazed that somebody loved it. I didn't, I didn't want anything to happen. Um, Sometimes write them just because they're the story that needs to be told. Um, that one, it has a message there, but it's not a super heavy handed message. Um, write the stories that speak to you and they'll come from every, everywhere. Um, what do you guys do to get motivated? What do you guys do to, to come up with story ideas? Anybody? Come on, don't be shy. Anybody on Zoom want to answer that question? I get a lot of ideas from friends and uh, working with other colleagues. And sometimes they just uh, bubble up or somebody will make a comment in a group meeting that I'm in and I'll run with it. Okay, while well, we're waiting for Greg to get to the mic, anybody else want to on Zoom? Come on guys, don't be afraid to share. Well, since I'm since I'm standing here, um, most of my stuff kind of comes to me in pieces of dreams, and I usually end up starting with a character, some character, and I put them in a situation, and it evolves as I add characters to what's going on until. A direction starts. I don't really, I'm, I'm more of a by the seat of the pants kind of writer. And I do a lot of uh, 
post-production proofreading after the book's already done, then I'll reread it and find all the mistakes I made and then resubmit it and go that way. But uh, it all just comes in, in pieces. And sometimes I'll write real heavy for a while and then a few days will go by, I'll just go about my normal routine and then another scene or another segment or another character just all of a sudden comes comes about. Sometimes I pull from people that I have met or run into or something and other times it's just a total imaginary thing and the travel takes me sometimes all over the world because of that just in my mind but that's how I do it. Oh nice. I think we have, we have someone else. Anyone else on Zoom? Oh here comes Hap. She's going to share. Get ready if you're on Zoom and you want to unmute after Hap's done. Okay, so I actually spent nearly 60 hours last year trying to learn social media marketing. I was unable to finish the course because, oops, the videos got uh, deleted before I finished. So, uh, all that to say that in the process of events, the entire, almost the entire 60 hours was spent making a um, document of topics for, say, a post, a story, a reel. And so now I have this nice document of everything imaginable, and uh, I have another purpose for it now. So rather than <laughs> worrying about social media, which I don't even like, uh, I'll be using that for my writing. So thanks for the tip. <laughs> Well, we've got another person here in the room, Sophia. Um, I actually take inspiration from other works of art. So whenever I read a book, uh, I think, oh, this is really interesting what they're doing here. I wonder if I could use some of this for any of my stories or like kind of this trajectory that's happening, movies, uh, TV shows, and then also um, Tabletop role play helps a lot. Actually, uh, figuring out how characters speak and what sort of an arc for a character would look like. So I, that's kind of a niche thing, but it works for me. Nice, nice. I'll share mine simple deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> we are related. <laughs> Um, I'll share mine. This is Karen on on Zoom. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's why I have fallen in love with Substack because having written for newspapers, magazines, novels, children's books, and all of it, this is a new fun way to just be able to share little memoir stories about things that I like to chat with uh, for people. And I always try to do something that I think is either funny or inspiring, one or the other, or both, <laughs> if I can. And uh, I, I would encourage people to use it because number one, it's free. And number two, you can increase your readership in a hurry if, if your writing is intriguing. So there's my two bits worth. Thank you, Karen. Eileen, go ahead. Hi, I'm Eileen, and I just wanted to tell you that what inspires me is when I see a Vietnam veteran hat, because I'm writing a story about an 11 year old girl that has a paper route, and I go through the whole story of what was going on at that point. Well, very nice. I had a whole story starting to build just as you were telling me that. That's very cool. Those <laughs> Anybody else together. on Zoom that wants to share how they, the process for getting motivated to write? I can say something. Uh, a lot of people know that I actually don't publish traditionally. Um, I, I, like Michelle, deadlines are my, are my motivation. Um, I run a, my website's a subscription and I have a Patreon subscription. 
So I have to have chapters out on a regular basis so that my paying subscribers um, keep following me. And that also grows my audience too. And I'll have to jump off on what Kevin and Michelle said. Uh, deadlines also motivate me because I hate showing up a critique group with nothing to share. I think we had a question over here, but can you go to the mic to ask? Because the people on Zoom can't hear you unless you're at the mic. Well, I just, oh, hold on. No, because seriously, they will not be able to hear you. Okay. Here, let me give you this mic if you don't want to. I was just going to ask Karen to once again say, is it Substack? What did she say? Substack. Substack? Mm -hmm. Stack. Stack. Substack. Ah. Never heard of it. I'm going to write that down and look it up. Anyone else? Okay, Debbie. I think that's kind of one of the messages. The the motive, the things are all around us. They come to us. Um, we all do it differently. You've got some really nice books over there. I, there's books I'm going to be looking right so I already checked them out I own some of them some of them are great motivators for me um big creative uh excuse me big magic Elizabeth Gilbert great Hey guys, suddenly the system crashed. Hold on just a minute, okay? Liam, if you can hear me from the Zoom side, we lost audio and the speaker is frozen on our video, but you might already know that. Okay. The Zoom recipients can hear each other. I think it's just the library side of it. Yep, I think it's just them too. I think their internet crashed. Yeah. Poor Liam. We have to send him a box of chocolates. Instead of a box of chocolates, why don't we send him some coal? Some, some coal? <laughs> <laughs> he might he might set the system on fire if we send him uh, <laughs> fire making materials. I don't know. Uh, oh, the good to see everybody on today. I've been enjoying this presentation. It's great. Yeah, she's doing a great job. And I, I really felt it was relevant when she was talking about things that people, that children care about, because I had written my fairy tale for adults and then looked at maybe marketing it to kids. But then we started looking at exactly what the main character, the things that were driving him, and they weren't things that drive children. So it needs to kind of stay an adult fairy tale on that. But it also gave me a jumping off point where I can maybe um, do a kid's version, but I got to change the motivations. And I think that was really um, valid what she was saying there about what drives kids versus what drives adults. You know, I think sometimes it's kids like to read about other kids. So if you take your character and you make the kid uh, younger, then there's a whole different POV shift. The point of view changes and uh, 
I might get kids involved that way. Yeah. Good idea. Love your story. Well, yeah, I can't <laughs> can't really do that with a very old man. Yeah. But the thing is, when I was a kid, I used to read stories. I would have been fine with a very old man. But like she said, kids are different today. Yeah. So how do I know what a kid my my youngest is 25 now. I don't I don't know what kids today think about or what they're interested in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, well, mine's going to be 20 in May, but she just got a job working at the uh, child care center there on campus. So she's working with four and five year olds. And Kat is just a great person to bounce things off of. So I think maybe I need to just start with a brand new, fresh concept and try and do it more specifically for that audience. So I think so, too. Yeah. And, and leave your very old man the way it is, because it's really good. Uh, thank and you, you know, there's a a writer. Her name is uh, now I can't remember Kingfisher, and she rewrites fairy tales. Uh, and they're adult fairy tales. Well, she's redone Beauty and the Beast, and she comes up with her own kind of fairy tale like stories. Yeah, and yours there's... is more more um, it's more rhythm than hers, but it's still very similar. Adults yeah. like fairy tales. It's if you like I, fantasy, you like fairy tales. So yeah, I think so too. Oh, it's uh, good. I think we can actually maybe here at the library. I don't know. I'm trying to check to see if we're connected by uh, chat on our phones. They haven't posted anything. No, they haven't. Yeah. We are up. We're back apparently. Can everyone hear yes. me already? We have audio and video on Zoom now. Excellent. Okay, so while while we were dark, um, Sophia asked a fabulous question regarding handling social media in the writing because since so many younger people, that's how they communicate. So and so I'm gonna have Debbie repeat her answer to that. Wow, I hope I get it right this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> the pressure. Um, I don't. I have not incorporated social media. The question was, have I done it? Um, in my writing, what I have done so far, and the answer is no, but I have the intent to do it because I think that's only authentic based upon dependent upon the age of the characters. Um, I wouldn't put it in for younger stu uh, for younger children, because basically as an adult I don't want to encourage them to do that anyway, and if I'm saying that you know do this, then don't go do that. Um, I, I tried to keep my own kids off social media up until a point, and then you recognize, okay, this is their world out there, and I need to be able to deal with it, and I would do it in an appropriate manner and include it in, um, because I think it would be relevant to the story. The same as though uh, if I were putting a text in, um, which will be happening soon, in, in a story, I'm not going to have it spelled correctly. I'm not even going to punctuate it correctly as much as that's going to kill me because I know that's not what happens. Are you ready to go? I mean, that's the letter R. Um, drives me insane and I want to correct people, um, but I want them to read it. I want to, them to feel like they can relate to it. So um, it would be in the manner that I see them using it. And when I have questions, I go to my students of a certain age, you know, um, hey, what, what, what's your favorite video game? What are you, what are you doing here? Um, it lets me know them. Uh, some of them I played. Some of them like, uh, no, <laughs> never heard of that one. That's a new one on me. And no, I've not played Minecraft. Um, but I want to know about it so I can incorporate it, and so that I get to know them better as people. And they're well-rounded. They're just like us. Just still formulating think of the power you have as a kids lit writer if you think about that um can you remember a book that you read when you were younger that really impacted you i had to go look it up the other day in fact i got a free download on my kindle for it so i could read it again um uh and i assumed it was a story that most people had known it was written in 18 something what katie did anybody read that one what Katie did. Um, I started reading 
Dickens and Shakespeare at 10. So I don't know what age I read that one, but it really stuck with me. Poor Katie. And in my memory, poor Katie was uh, an invalid for the rest of her life. And I don't think that's true. So I'm not a spoiler alert there. But Katie was this um, rambunctious, outgoing person who did something she wasn't supposed to do and was bedridden. And Katie became the saint. She was so nice to everybody and so kind to everybody. And I remember reading that book going, I want to be like Katie when I grow up, but boy, I don't know if I can be that nice, mm -hmm. you know, but it had an impact on me. I want to be really nice to everybody all the time. But right now I think I'm going to go beat my brother up because he's annoying me. You know, I'm not ready there yet, but um, interesting that it just, and it has stuck with me this many years later wow, I want to be a better person. And that was what the book was about. Um, the messages, the what you put in there. And that's why I'm a little nervous about social media. Um, it's not going away. It's just going to grow and grow and grow until that's their only way of communicating. Um, so incorporating it is important. Um, think about that too as you're writing if you're doing middle grade if you're doing YA um, any kind of kids lit and adult lit too um, how long are your chapters we live in a very fast paced world what James Patterson I did his master class once um, 300 words in a chapter that's it um, just reading a book written by a woman who's an engineer architect um, Orange County has uh, gotten a lot of press uh, in a second, and some of her chapters are a page, because that's the world that we live in. It's real quick. It's real fast. I can I can read one chapter, just one more chapter before I go to sleep. I can just read one while I'm standing in the line at the, you know, the grocery store. I, yes, I have a book in my purse. Um, so that's the kind of world they live in. So if you're doing any kind of chapter stuff, keep them short, keep the pace moving because pacing is what's going to keep them engaged. Um, if you look at Dickens, who I love, he is not fast paced. If you ask a, a high school student to read Dickens, they're probably going to groan and say all kinds of things. And where can I get the cliff notes? Or is there a movie for that? Yeah. Right. Um, so think about that as you're doing that. Um, I had asked about um, how you get your motivation. Anybody here do morning pages? Okay. Remember, I like you guys. Okay. And I'm going to challenge you to do morning pages, three pages longhand every day. Um, Julia Cameron's. Uh, it's a whole series of things to do. Every time I've done morning pages, I have gone into creative overload and I don't want to do my regular job. I get so much and I get story ideas like crazy. Um, so I didn't want to write three pages. I didn't want to do it first thing in the morning. I don't do it first thing in the morning. I do it about 10 o'clock. Um, I need coffee. I need other things to happen before I'm going to sit down and do that. I've done it at nighttime. Well, I'm not going to write a full page. She means a regular full, like you've got a piece of paper there. So I get the little journals. I can do three pages of those. Well, I've now switched it to remarkable. Does anybody know what a remarkable is? Oh, it's totally remarkable. Okay. Um, it, it, you get the feel of writing with a pen. And you can set up all these folders and all these notebooks in there. And you can tag things in there so when I have these I would do it in my journals and I would have this great idea and I would have to like find a way to mark the page and hope I'd remember to go back to it that's the story idea that's a poem I would write whole things in the morning not meaning to um, now in the remarkable I can just tag it and I've got you know kids tags poetry tags this tag that tag um, it's a little pricey but it is worth every single penny that you spend on it. And I'm not here trying to sell it. I'm just trying to say it's what I use now. Um, and it's in my bag. Nope, it is a device. It's a, it's in my bag. You're feel free to be my Vanna. He hates going in my purse. That's why I carry that big bag so I can Yeah, you gotta take my pen. So that they can see it on Zoom. 
So, and you use the you use a basically a stylus pen, um, and you can write on it. It has the feel of actually using paper. And I'm it has it has changed my writing. Um, I was getting a little stagnant there. Um, I used to always write longhand and then type it and use the typing time for edits and then time became an issue. So then I just started typing everything. Then I went, well, I'll just use my iPad and I type on that. I've gone through all different versions of it depending upon where I'm at, what, you know, I don't want to lug my laptop around. Um, but the remarkable, um, I have multiple stories I'm writing in there right now. Um, I can flip back and forth between them. I can write anywhere I am. Um, and all you have to do is remember to charge it. And that's like charging your phone anymore, right? You're not going to forget it. Um, it is a great product. Um, and it changed it. And it let me go back to doing morning pages. Because the downside of morning pages, um, if you have family um, and you leave your journals around, um, I, le I left mine sitting everywhere. Um, I just looked at my family and said, please don't read that because the writing is not very good in there. Um, it's just whatever I decided to get up and write. And some mornings was, I hate doing morning pages. This is stupid for three pages until it cleared it out. And then you go, I would go into creative overload. I cannot keep up with my ideas. I literally cannot keep up with them, which is a blessing and a curse. But as you get these ideas as you're writing, and you're working on something, where do you put them? I carry that, but then I pull my phone out and put it on notes. Because <laughs> that's the quicker one for a short idea. So I'm going to, I'm just going to challenge you to do morning pages if you haven't. She has uh, artist dates that you do for a week and all kinds of other things. I don't have the time to do that. I don't spend that time on myself. Um, but those morning pages will change things for you. If you're struggling for ideas, you will not you will not struggle anymore. Um, Julia Cameron, and she has a whole bunch of books out. The first one is The Artist's Way. She just has a new one out, which I have, and I'm ashamed to say I forgot the title. Um, she's got one for people who are coming at it later in life. It's never too late. Um, she just has all these little wonderful nuggets of information in there. Um, and they're books that you can pick up and read. Thank you. That you can pick up and read um, just little parts and bits of. That's not how she really intends it, but you can do that. So um, find your inspiration and go out and write your stories. Can Can you hold that up so the people in Zoom can see what you're talking about? Just hold it. The camera's this way. Just face straight forward. Open it. Yeah. There you go. It's just a remarkable. Here's the camera right here. There you go. Good. And you can write on it apparently. You can. <laughs> we should have put a test page here. <laughs> um, and I am not a spokesperson for the company. Uh, my, my dear sweet husband got it for me. Um, but it is a, a wonderful tool. I carried my um, iPad for a lot of years, got the you know keypad to go with it, and I could write anywhere. Um, and that's the question. Do you guys need peace and quiet? Do you have to have a soundtrack you listen to? How do you write? Where do you write? Do you guys need music? Who needs music? Who needs peace and quiet? Who can write if there was a storm raging and kids are screaming and there's utter chaos? So, yeah, um, it lets you kind of find those places. I used to take my youngest son, um, our version of an artist state, he's a very good writer himself. Um, and we would go out and we would go sit at the mall. Of course, he'd hit me up to buy him lunch first. And we'd just go sit there. We'd find a bench and we'd sit somewhere. And then we would do character profiles of people. Now, we both draw as well. So sometimes we'd be sketching them, which is got to be careful. They come back behind you and see what you've drawn. Um, or we'd write things about them. And I've got the most amazing characters that I've um, come up with just from doing that. I'm driving down the road and I see somebody. I've written a little character profile about them in my head before I ever get to my destination. And I have this whole backstory of who they are and what's going on. And that's why I have like way too many ideas and I can't use them all. Um, helicopter circling overhead one morning while I was doing morning pages and it started a whole story that I need to finish now. Um, 
I, I don't know where it came from other than I heard the helicopter and then I saw this character in my head. Um, but find your inspiration and write it, then find your audience to read it before you put it out into the world. Listen to them. They are brutally honest. They will tell you the truth whether you want to know it or not. Many years ago, I learned this the hard way. I, as the instructor in a karate class, demoed a technique. And I had a student demo it. I purposely did it really poorly. The student did it to the best of their ability. And I looked at the class and said, now, why did they do it better? I expected because this hand was in this position, they did this, they did that. And they looked me square in the eye and said, because he's younger. <laughs> <laughs> so they will be honest with you. And I was like, that's not it. Um, but they will be honest and they'll tell you what they don't like. And if you don't get a beta reader, if you don't get your audience to read it, and not your kids and not your grandkids, unless they are exceptionally honest with you, um, you're going to put something out there that the cut is just going to get closed. You're not going to get it read. And that you may never know that. But if the goal of your story is to touch somebody, which I think it is for most of us, then you want it to be read. That's why we put all these hours into it. Listen to them. Listen to them while they're speaking. Go hang out at a park and listen to kids. Then clean up some of the language from some of the kids so you can make it appropriate for your age book. But they are, there are some really deep conversations going on. There's some real brutal conversations going on between bunches of kids. That's the real world they live in. It's the world we all live in. So meet your audience and have fun with your stories. Were there any questions I didn't answer? Okay, we'll <laughs> open it up for questions now. Anyone uh, have a question in the room or so? Go to the mic. Anyone on Zoom have any questions for Debbie before she slinks away from the uh, the she, podium over there? She is she's, trying to escape. You know, you could do some karate moves. That'd be fine. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Debbie? Just for the Zoom people, I did put the links for the Remarkable and for the Morning Pages in the chat if you want to refer back to those. Okay. Everybody, she did such a good job. No one has a question. <laughs> Here, let me bring her the mic. Oh, sorry. Do not apologize. We just want voice person just has it. Well, we want the people on Zoom to hear. It isn't about just the room. They can't hear you. So here you go. Um, did you say will the remarkable type it after you've written in, in uh longhand? Yes, actually, it will translate it out into um, text. You got to be careful with it. It needs to learn your handwriting. And I, I have fairly neat handwriting, but sometimes when I'm writing, it gets like I'm in the groove and it gets a little sloppy. Um, sometimes you have to go back and go, no, that wasn't even close to the word that I did. And there have been times I've looked at the remarkable and looked at the screen and looked at the remarkable going, where did you get that? I'm not even sure what I wrote now. You've confused me. But it will put it out. You can email it to yourself as handwriting. You can email it to yourself or someone else as a PDF text. Um, so it, it does multi-purpose that way. It's just still on a learning curve with that. You're welcome. Okay, any more questions for Debbie? No? Okay, any parting words of wisdom, Debbie? Have fun, right? Get your work out there. And thank you for having me this morning. <laughs> okay, I'm hurrying to the mic. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. I don't write specifically for children, but boy, I took away some things as well, even as someone who doesn't, doesn't fit that genre. A couple of last minute announcements, and then I'm going to uh, bring Sophia up here to announce next month's speaker. Uh, free books, if you're in the room, don't forget about the free books. Also, if you're in the room, we have a sign up list for email. If you wanna get our emails as to upcoming speakers, events, um, publication opportunities. Um, we're looking at potentially doing the Hemet Comic Con, which is next month 
here as a guild. I'm working into that to see where the board of directors approved us being involved, but I don't have enough details to give you today. So look for emails coming out. We want to have a table at the Comic-Con so that people can meet and greet us. And if we have any uh, speculative fiction, science fiction authors that want to bring their books that day to sell and sign, that would be good too. Um, don't forget to pick up anthology guidelines or go to the website. Uh, pay your dues because that's important to keep us doing what we do. And the last thing is, is that Emilio's lunch at uh, noon. If for anyone who wants to go, I'll need a head count before people leave the room. Sophia, up to you. So thank you so much, Debbie. That was an absolutely superb talk. I really, really enjoyed it. And as you can see, everyone else did too. So we have another superb speaker for next month, and that is Lori Cooper, who will be presenting top 10 tips for a successful promo push. Uh, Lori Cooper is an award-winning speaker who launched her online business, PubCraft, marketing for books and brands in October 2013. She helps fiction authors go from struggling, feeling invisible, and not knowing what to do next, to finding and connecting with their ideal readers. In her first year of business, Lori went from one to over 200 clients and helped 100 plus authors hit the New York Times and USA Today bestselling lists. While she works as a marketing coach with authors from around the world, Lori calls Ottawa, Canada her home. Lori and her course, The Visible Author Method, have allowed hundreds of clients to simplify their marketing efforts, leading to more time to write. So if that sounds like something that interests you, please join us next month. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. So that's it. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful rest of the February. It's a long month. It's 29 days this year. And uh, we'll see you all in March. Thank you. And everybody on Zoom, thanks for joining us. Uh, our next monthly meeting is March 16th. And don't forget to fill out the meeting feedback form because we do read them. Take care, everybody. <laughs>